Catlick fans, you've officially sold out the Catlick Live finale. We're so excited. If you got a ticket, we can't wait to see you on March the 14th. You should have received an email earlier this week with all the details regarding Saturday night's big event. We'll see you there. This episode of Catlick includes strong language and graphic scenes of violence. Listener discretion is advised. They were summoned from the hillside. They were called in from the land and the country. By 1915, the conflict in Europe had escalated into a full-blown international crisis. World War I was raging. Though America was still a few years away from entering the war, Great Britain was already fully engaged. In 1915, Frederick Wheeler released the patriotic anthem, Keep the Home Fires Burning, an ode to all the British troops fighting on foreign soil. Keep the home fires burning while your hearts are yearning. Meanwhile, back in America, a strange new fire was burning on the big screen. That January, the world's first ever blockbuster film was released to American audiences. It was a really big deal back then, and in some ways, it's still a big deal today. Even recently, a film critic for the Boston Globe dubbed this film the most influential film in all of history. The black and white movie Birth of a Nation by director D.W. Griffith was a work of historical fiction about the Civil War in the American South. And it absolutely stunned moviegoers in 1915. A lot of the filmmaking techniques you see in movies today were first pioneered in Birth of a Nation. Night scenes, cross-cutting, tracking shots, close-ups. It was also the first production to feature huge battle scenes. When it released, newspaper articles touted the film as having 18,000 actors and 3,000 horses. When you think about it, this is kind of crazy. Back then, nobody knew what war was like unless you'd actually fought in one. And now, for the first time, you could see it all. The guns, the horses, the rising smoke of muskets and cannons playing out before you as you sat comfortably in a theater chair. Also, though it was a silent film, the director paired it with a custom orchestral score. So while there were no words, an audience could listen to dramatic music while watching the scenes unfold before them. Again, we take this stuff for granted, but keep in mind, this was the first time in human history people could experience something like this. And while this is all well and good, there was one small, strike that, one major problem. Birth of a Nation was a work of outright propaganda, revisionist history, and brazen racism. Griffith had adapted the film from a book called The Klansman, which called for romantic views of the Old South and thrilling scenes of hooded Ku Klux Klan men riding through the countryside on horseback like a bunch of damn heroes. Perhaps the worst part of the film is its portrayal of African Americans. The black characters in the movie are portrayed as these scary savages prowling around and preying on white women. Of course, they're not played by black people, they're played by white people in blackface. There's this scene of some black lawmakers where they're all drunk and shoeless and eating chicken. In another scene, the KKK rides up on horses and dumps this black guy's body on a front porch. It's all so cringy, awful, and evil. What's more, President Woodrow Wilson hosted a private screening of Birth of a Nation. It was the first film ever to be shown inside the White House. Now, it's debated whether or not President Woodrow Wilson fully endorsed it, though one of the title screens uses a quote from one of Wilson's books. Here it is. The white men were roused by a mere instinct of self-preservation until at last there had sprung into existence a great Ku Klux Klan, a veritable empire of the South to protect the Southern country. Wilson showing the film caused a big stir because when the movie came out, it was pretty controversial. 
The NAACP immediately condemned the film and called on cities to ban it from theaters. While still not enough, African Americans had made some progress in fighting for their dignity since slavery, in beating back some of the old stereotypes and lies that Southerners had been brainwashed to believe. Birth of a Nation threatened to undo all that while simultaneously revivifying the South's dormant white supremacy. Now, Birth of a Nation didn't come to Atlanta theaters till later in 1915, but it was already being talked about in the papers earlier that year. As early as May, a film critic for the Atlantic Constitution called it, quote, wonderful. So, why am I bringing this up? Well, in an earlier episode, I mentioned how there have been two different KKKs throughout American history. The original Klan was started right after the Civil War ended in 1865 by some Confederate veterans. It was basically a paramilitary vigilante group that sought to undo a lot of the gains African Americans had made after the Civil War. It quickly devolved into a terrorist group, and by 1871, the federal government banned the KKK threatening to use lethal force if necessary. After that, the KKK withered away and slowly began to fade from the Southern consciousness. But now, here we are in 1915, in the middle of Jim Crow America in the South, a time when racial tensions were heating up and lynch mobs were still very much a real thing. Here we are in 1915, just a couple of years removed from the racial terror and racial cleansing of Forsyth County. And a Hollywood director releases the biggest film of all time in which the KKK is back. Though it had been crushed more than 40 years earlier, the gallant legacy of the KKK still lived on in the minds of many Southerners. And now? Now, their antebellum, anti-Black nostalgia for the good old days could be seen on the silver screen in most theaters across America. The American South was pregnant, and it was about to give birth to a baby demon, the second coming of the KKK. A terrifying revival of scathing scorn, a renewal of violence and venom, a renaissance of hateful horror. And when that baby comes, it will take its first stinking breath on Georgia soil. You're listening to episode 21 of Catlick. The Caravan. It's January of 1915, month number 49 of our story. When we last left off, two separate but connected dramas were swirling in Atlanta. The strike at the Fulton Bag and Cotton Mill and the Leo Frank appeals. Though he'd lost his top spy, Oscar Elsis welcomed the news that Ola Delight Smith had left town never to return. And with his scheduled execution less than a month away, Leo Frank's legal team began aggressively pursuing their final options. Well, by January, Sarah Conboy was back in Atlanta as a leader of the strike happening at Fulton Bag. Through Harry Preston's reports, we know that Sarah Conboy was both confident and competent, a worthy foe to Elsis and his sophisticated strike-breaking strategy. With Harry Preston outed and run out of town, there was renewed optimism that the strike could prevail and forever change life for mill workers in the South. The union efforts got even more good news when Congressman William Green submitted a resolution before Congress, calling on them to investigate the situation at Fulton Bag, as well as conditions around all the mills of the South. In February, Green finally got to argue for his resolution on the floor 
of the House. A loud debate ensued amongst reps from the North versus the South. They were basically trying to decide if it was even the federal government's role to investigate a private enterprise. But just a few days after this debate, it was announced that the Commission on Industrial Relations would, in fact, investigate the Fulton Bag and Cotton Mill. And this was a big deal. This small strike happening down in Atlanta had risen to the highest reaches of the U.S. government. When Oscar got news of the forthcoming investigation, he sprung into action. He first tasked some of his men with investigating the individual members of the commission. No surprise there. He also identified a judge out in California who was connected to one of the members of the commission. He wrote Judge Richard Sloss a two-page memo essentially calling on him to use his influence to dissuade the commission from launching any kind of investigation in Atlanta. Again, he invoked the name of Leo Frank to make a point. Here is a portion of what Elsis wrote to the judge. From developments, it is self-evident that the labor unions had made up their minds to attack our mill as an entering wedge in the southern mill conditions. They chose our mill at this psychological moment. The conditions producing same have been brought about by the unfortunate notoriety given the Frank trial, and our being co-religionists. Were it not for this, I really believe that they would have made their first efforts at some other mill in preference to ours. Basically, Oscar believes that unionizers have been dying to get into the southern textile mills, and when the Frank trial broke out, they seized upon the rising anti-Semitism by targeting one of the few mills in Georgia owned by Jews. Oscar ended his letter to Judge Sloss by asking him to, quote, talk of us favorably, end quote, to the commission. Oscar Elsis remained laser-focused, crushed the strike, protect the mill, no matter what. Meanwhile, across town, Leo Frank's legal team at the end of 1914 had escalated their client's case to the U.S. Supreme Court. Remember, they'd been denied by the Georgia Supreme Court and pretty much every other lower court around. They were still on the hunt for some governing body that would throw out the Frank verdict or get a new trial altogether. Surprisingly, the U.S. Supreme Court agreed to take up the case. This meant that Frank's January execution would once again be delayed. In late February, the Supreme Court began hearing arguments. This is month 50 of our story. There were now two branches of the U.S. government contending with different but connected dramas down in Atlanta. But it would be several months before Leo Frank would hear anything. By March, the strike at Fulton Bag had suffered a shocking loss of momentum. This is month 51 of our story. Despite Charles Miles and Sarah Conboy's best efforts and the forthcoming federal investigation, one by one, beleaguered families began to disappear from the tent colony. And honestly, I can't really blame them. They just survived a brutal winter sleeping every night in soggy tents with no heat and no plumbing. Reports indicate that by March, there were only a few dozen bedraggled souls left in the camp. The Union's vision of a happy, utopian labor encampment was withering a bit more each day. In April, the U.S. Supreme Court rendered their decision in the Leo Frank case. Month number 52 of our story. For what must have felt like the thousandth time, it was more bad news for Leo Frank. In a 7-2 vote, the U.S. Supreme Court denied his appeal. Per protocol, the two justices who dissented from the court's decision released a statement. Here's an excerpt that summarizes their thinking. Mob law does not become due process of law by securing the dissent of a terrorized jury. We think the presumption overwhelming that the jury responded to the passions of the mob. In a nutshell, the jurors got caught up in all the anti-Frank hate swirling around the city, and they therefore felt compelled to deliver a guilty verdict, lest the whole city lose its mind and start burning things down. 
Either way, having two out of nine justices on his side probably wasn't much consolation when news of the verdict made its way to Leo Frank's cell at the Fulton Tower. In his wonderful book, And the Dead Shall Rise, author Steve Oney describes the scene. Frank was smoking a cigarette when a Georgian reporter arrived at the tower with the bad news. Initially, the condemned man could not speak. After a moment, though, he said, I am very much disappointed. Then he began to pace the tiny enclosure that for so long had been his home. I will never suffer the death penalty, he declared between puffs. Truth will ultimately prevail. Then Frank's wife appeared. Unlike at previous dark moments, Lucille was now composed. She approached her husband's cell and, reaching her hands between the bars, pulled him to her, kissing him on the cheek. For the third time, his execution was rescheduled. The new date was set for June 22nd, just a couple of months away. With mere weeks to work, Frank's legal team began to pursue their final option. Frank's last hope rested with the governor of Georgia, John Slayton. In the state of Georgia, the governor is vested with the executive power to commute the sentence of someone on death row. The legal process meant that Frank's attorneys would make their case before a state prison commission, and then they, in turn, would make their recommendation to Slayton about whether or not the death sentence should stand. But the governor would have the final say. There was, however, one vexing problem. Governor Slayton was on his way out. His term officially ended around the time of Frank's scheduled execution, and the incoming governor, a man named Nathaniel Harris, would then take office. Of the two men, Frank's lawyers decided that Slayton represented their best chance. They would push hard to get the prison commission to begin the proceedings and hope that Slayton would reduce Frank's sentence from death to life in prison before he left office in late June. Leo Frank's life was hanging by a thread, and John Slayton was the only man who could save him. It's now May of 1915, month 53 of our story. On May the 7th, one of the pivotal catastrophes of World War I took place. The Atlanta Constitution reported. Headline. Over 1,000 lives lost on Lusitania when sunk by German submarine. Two German torpedoes slammed into the hull of a massive British ocean liner called the Lusitania. But this wasn't a warship. This was a passenger boat, kind of like the Titanic. The final body count was 1,200 civilians. This was a very big deal. Meanwhile, back in Atlanta, something else was sinking. A few weeks earlier, leaders of the strike at Fulton Bag had received the devastating news that the federal investigation into the mill's practices had been canceled. When strike leaders asked why they weren't given a straight answer, though many suspected Oscar's backroom dealings had convinced someone in Washington to withdraw the inquiry. And with this final devastating blow, with the loss of city support, and with the gradual abandonment of the tent colony and the daily picket lines, the strike at the Fulton Bag and Cotton Mill was officially dead. Once hopeful workers, now defeated, dispersed into the city of Atlanta on the hunt for new living accommodations and other means of employment. What remained of the commissary was deconstructed and the tent colony was disassembled. Despondent strike leaders packed up and left Atlanta behind them. What had begun as a humble people's opposition to predatory labor practices and demeaning living conditions had officially been crushed by Oscar Elsis, a cunning strategist with vast resources and an iron will. His final act in regards to the strike was that anyone who supported the strike would be forever banished from working in the Fulton Bag and Cotton Mill. Has a book ever stuck with you, like really stuck with you? A couple years ago, I listened to Kevin Kelly's audiobook called Inevitable, Understanding the 12 Technological Forces That Will Shape Our Future. 
I remember listening to it in the car while I was driving up to Kentucky to visit my mom for Christmas. To this day, I still think about the insights from that book. Well, that whole experience was made possible by Audible.com. If you're like me, it seems like it's getting harder and harder to find time to read books. Well, this is where Audible comes in. They've got thousands of titles, plus other great content like podcasts, guided wellness programs, theatrical performances, A-list comedy, and exclusive Audible originals you won't find anywhere else. Plus, the Audible app is pretty awesome. It's free, it can be easily downloaded to any tablet or smartphone, and it allows you to listen to your audiobooks even when you're offline. Audible.com is a proud sponsor of episode 19 of Catlick, and they'd like to offer Catlick listeners a free audiobook. To claim yours, just visit audible.com slash catlick or text the word catlick to 500, 500 Check it out today. At the end of May, the commutation hearing for Leo Frank began. Again, Frank's attorneys would make their best case before the state prison commission, and then that body would make a recommendation to Governor John Slayton whether or not to commute Frank's sentence. In the weeks leading up to the hearing, a massive behind-the-scenes campaign was waged on behalf of Leo Frank. The Constitution reported that by the time the hearing began in late May, the governor himself had already received 75,000 letters from people across America, each of them asking the governor to spare Frank's life. Leo Frank's jail cell was also overflowing with mail. He reportedly began receiving about 1,000 letters per day from well-wishers. During the hearings of the State Prison Commission, there was one new development highlighted by Frank's attorneys. Judge Leonard Rohn, the white-haired judge who'd presided over the Frank trial, had died. But before he died, he wrote a lengthy statement expressing doubt in Leo Frank's guilt. He even made a provision that if he were to die before the matter was settled, the letter should be delivered to the appropriate authorities in the hopes that Frank's life would be spared. Between Judge Leonard Rohn and Attorney William Smith, that now made two high-profile people involved with the case who now believed that Frank was innocent. On June the 9th, after hearing all arguments, the State Prison Commission rendered their decision. It's now month 54 of our story. By a margin of two to one, they voted to not recommend clemency for Leo Frank. Yet again, bad news for Leo Frank. Once this story broke, all eyes fixated on Governor John Slayton and whether or not he would heed the commission's recommendation or go his own way and spare Frank from the gallows. The pressure he was under was intense. By now, the Frank affair had exploded back into the papers with near daily coverage. Opinions on both sides of the aisle were fierce. And John Slayton knew that with a man's life hanging in the balance, he would have to disappoint someone. Either the smaller group of Frank supporters or the much larger contingency of the state's population demanding the noose. On June the 12th, Governor John Slayton convened one final hearing of evidence. The affair was a private one conducted inside his personal office at the state capitol building. To Slayton's credit, he was staunchly committed to an intense review of the case before rendering a decision. These hearings transpired over several days. Here are the highlights. With attorneys from both sides present, one of Frank's lawyers began with a strange argument. You'll remember many episodes ago, I told you that when investigators entered the basement of the National Pencil Company to examine the Mary Fagan murder scene, they observed a mysterious pile of fresh, undisturbed human excrement. Fresh and undisturbed, that's a key point. The pile of poo had been deposited in the shaft of the elevator that connected the factory's lobby to its basement. Well, at some point, somebody dubbed this the shit in the shaft. 
The shit in the shaft had not really been talked about that much during the trial, but Frank's attorneys dwelled on it a lot in these hearings. Here was their argument. Jim Conley had openly admitted to relieving himself in the elevator shaft on that Saturday morning, a few hours before Mary Fagan arrived to collect her pay. Another part of Conley's testimony was that after Frank killed Mary Fagan up in the metal room, he convinced Conley to dispose of the body in the basement. Conley had then said he boarded the elevator with the body, descended to the basement, and then left the body there. Since the trial, Frank's attorneys identified a big inconsistency in Jim Conley's story. When investigators first arrived on the scene, the pile of poo was not smashed. They saw it. They wrote about it. But later in the day, a group of them boarded the elevator and descended into the basement. When they reached the bottom, the elevator smashed the poop, sending up a whiff of stink noticed by all. Here was the inconsistency. Had Jim Conley taken Mary to the basement in the elevator, as he claimed, the feces would have already been smashed. I know it's kind of a weird case to make, but I guess they felt it was important since it had sort of been glossed over during the trial. Again, they're looking for anything to get John Slayton to question the jury's verdict. Apparently, their strategy worked. The governor took a keen interest in the mystery feces, even inquiring whether or not it was possible for the elevator to descend and be stopped before touching the ground and thereby not crushing the poo. Lawyers from both sides disagreed on whether or not that was possible. Slayton was just kind of annoyed. Either way, lots of poop talk in this appeal. Also present in this closed-door session with the governor was Hugh Dorsey, the original prosecutor in the Frank case. He believed, as strongly as ever, that Frank was guilty. Again, he laid out the facts just as he'd presented them in the trial. He first attacked the idea that the outcome of the trial was influenced by the public, the press, or local anti-Semitism. He made the point that if that were true, Frank's lawyers were free to request a change of venue. They never did. He also maintained that the issue of Frank's faith only came into play once Frank's attorneys knew they were losing the case. Next, Hugh Dorsey reminded John Slayton of the many character witnesses who spoke against Frank. He talked about the girls at the factory who'd heard Frank make inappropriate comments, and he pointed out that Frank's attorneys refused to cross-examine those girls because, in his opinion, they knew the girls had dirt on Frank. He also highlighted Frank's bizarre and nervous behavior when he was brought in for questioning. He reminded Slayton of Montine Stover, the young factory worker who'd arrived at Frank's office on that Saturday, and said that Frank was not in his office around noon, as he claimed. And finally, he made the case that even without Conley's testimony, all signs still pointed to Leo Frank as the killer of little Mary Fagan. In their final presentation, Frank's defense brought up the murder notes and the research William Smith had done, showing that Conley was the clear author of those notes and thus the true murderer. During these hearings, a certain fiddle champion showed up on the steps of the state capitol building. A crowd gathered around Cabbage Town's Fiddlin' John Carson as he played his anti-Frank anthem, The Ballad of Mary Fagan. Little Mary Fagan, she went to town one day. She went to the pencil factory to get her little pay. She left her home... Again, all this transpired over several days. Each day, the papers reported on what was happening, and the anticipation around the city grew. What would Governor Slayton decide? Uphold Frank's death sentence, and he'd likely be hailed as a hero for the rest of his life. Nullify it, and he'd be ruined. During these hearings, even more big names from around the country reached out to John Slayton on Leo Frank's behalf. Newspaper editors from around the nation sent messages to Slayton, among them the famous William Randolph Hearst, who wrote passionately on Frank's behalf, saying, Commutation to life imprisonment will prevent the possibility of a great mistake being made, a mistake which could never be rectified, a mistake which, if made, would involve you and Georgia in everlasting and unavailing sorrow and regret. 
Even Thomas Marshall, vice president of the United States, reached out to the governor, urging a commutation. This national interest made Slayton's decision even more difficult, as he must have felt torn between an unbiased review of the case, the passion of his Georgia constituents, and now national perception. Once the dust settled on the hearings, it was decision time. On Wednesday, June the 16th, Governor John Slayton, along with one other young lawyer, left the state capitol building with several large boxes of documents and evidence in tow. The two men drove north to Slayton's private, wooded estate in Buckhead. For three days, the men hunkered down over a large table with piles of documents stacked all around them. The two debated, discussed, and took copious notes. They stayed up late into the night, examining the evidence before them. One of the only people Slayton conferred with during this time was William Smith. He was summoned to Slayton's estate to explain in further detail his study of the murder notes and how they stacked up to Conley's other written and spoken statements. Slayton also, during those three days, made a quiet trip back into the city to visit the National Pencil Factory building for himself. There, he tested the elevator to discover, once and for all, whether it traveled automatically to the floor of the basement or whether it could be manually stopped before touching bottom. On Saturday, June the 19th, just days before his term as governor expired and just three days before Leo Frank's scheduled execution, Governor John Slayton made up his mind. It's worth noting here one of Leo Frank's earlier statements regarding this whole appeals process. He once told a reporter this. That my vindication will eventually come, I feel certain. Whether I will live to see it, I cannot tell. I am human enough to want to live to see it, for it is my right and due. But I may not. I may suffer death. Still, one thing is sure. The truth cannot be executed. Vindication may be long in coming, but it will come. With this knowledge, death itself has little terror for me. The truth cannot be executed. Before announcing his decision, Governor John Slayton wrote a 29-page letter explaining his rationale. He opened by reviewing the case against Frank, mentioning 12 distinct pieces of evidence that pointed towards Frank's guilt. He followed it, however, with a question that he believed everything hinged on. Did Jim Conley speak the truth? His answer to that question? No. He addressed the shit in the shaft, using much more delicate language than that, of course. He said he'd ridden that elevator several times and had found that it went all the way to the bottom every single time. This, he felt, was a major inconsistency in Conley's testimony about using the elevator to take Mary's body to the basement. He also cited the murder notes and the research of William Smith. This convinced him that the murder notes were not only written by Jim Conley, but that they could only have been conceived in Jim Conley's mind. And with that, Slayton announced his decision. He would reduce Leo Frank's sentence to life in prison. After two years of appeals, Leo Frank's life was finally spared. In his 29-page letter, Slayton also included this. The performance of my duty under the Constitution is a matter of my conscience. I can endure misconstruction, abuse, and condemnation, but I cannot stand the constant companionship of an accusing conscience, which would remind me in every thought that I, as governor of Georgia, failed to do what I thought to be right. John Slayton knew this decision of his was political suicide. But to him, this was not a matter of politics. It was a matter of conscience. The governor's decree was officially filed on Sunday, June the 20th, his last week in office. But before it was announced, he made a call that was both shrewd and wise. Though the Fulton Tower was a veritable fortress, even he did not trust its defenses against a jumbo-sized mob that could attempt to storm it. Because of this, he arranged an unannounced late-night transport 
for Leo Frank. Around midnight, an officer tapped on the bars of the cell of a sleeping Leo Frank. He woke, gathered his things, and was escorted to a waiting car behind the prison. Frank was then driven to Terminal Station, where he and a few others boarded the last southbound train of the day. Several hours later, the train arrived in the town of Macon, and from there, the group traveled by car to their final destination, the state prison farm in Milledgeville. John Slayton, suspecting mass outrage and possible riots in Atlanta, wanted to get Frank out of the hornet's nest. He felt the facility in Milledgeville was safer for Frank and more equipped to protect him from a lynch mob. As dawn broke the next day, the Constitution boomed the headline. Frank's sentence is commuted by Slayton. As expected, people were furious, and all hell broke loose as a mob of 5,000 people swarmed City Hall, shouting, chanting, and calling not just for Leo Frank's head, but for John Slayton's too. Pockets of violence broke out and a riot was avoided thanks only to a heavy police presence. Nevertheless, lots of arrests were made. Around midday, the exhausted governor spoke with reporters at his estate in Buckhead, north of the city. He pleaded with the citizens of Atlanta to read his report on the case and calmly, logically, non-emotionally consider its content. Yeah, good luck with that. By that afternoon, papers hit the streets of Atlanta that included Slayton's lengthy defense of Frank. It made no difference. The rage only intensified, and by dusk, the mob began to plan a road trip on foot to the governor's estate in Buckhead. A lynch mob was now moving towards the home of the state's highest elected official. As the sun dipped behind the skyscrapers of downtown Atlanta, 4,000 angry Atlantans began marching north on Peachtree Street, a straight shot six miles from downtown to Buckhead. As the mass of humanity trekked north, it grew, wreaking havoc along the way. Men smashed the windows of storefronts, looting them for guns and other implements that could be used for weapons. Three miles into their journey, they were met by a blockade. Several dozen Atlanta police officers mounted on horses. A small skirmish ensued. Many turned back, but not all. At least half the mob, 2,000 men, pressed on towards the governor's mansion. Word of the coming mob traveled fast, so police north of the city worked feverishly to fortify the governor's property. They established a perimeter using barbed wire, mounted police officers, and even armed citizens. Once Governor Slayton heard of the marauders heading his way, he moved quickly, making the dramatic decision to declare martial law. This declaration activated the state militia, the 5th Regiment to be exact. This was the same regiment that three years earlier had escorted Jane Daniel, Oscar Daniel, and Ernest Knox from the Fulton Tower to Terminal Station, where they would begin their journey north to their trial in Forsyth County. Upon receiving the distress call, the militiamen of the 5th Regiment raced to the governor's estate and surrounded his home with bayonets fixed. When the mob arrived, a standoff ensued. While no shots were fired, the frenzied civilians shouted down the men in uniform, hurling rocks, bricks, and bottles in their direction. When the soldiers began to advance on them, the unruly rubes quickly realized they were outgunned, prompting them to turn around and begin their retreat back into the city. Whatever relief the governor felt in that moment was short-lived. Shortly after the crowd dispersed, the governor and his entourage received word that a second mob had formed to the north, up in the Cobb County town of Marietta. You may remember that Marietta was the hometown of Mary Fagan. Like Atlanta, that community also erupted with outrage earlier in the day as angry Mariettans flooded the streets cursing the name of Governor John Slayton. Someone even made a stuffed dummy representing Slayton, strung it up a pole as if lynched, and hung a sign around it that said, John Slayton, 
king of the Jews and traitor governor of Georgia. Later in the day, the dummy was taken down and burned in the streets. As dusk fell, the Marietta Rage spilled over into the night, and a posse of 200 men began moving south with John Slayton's Buckhead Estate as their final destination. It was after midnight when word of this second mob arrived. The men of the 5th Regiment moved to the rear of John Slayton's estate and got into position. Having stared down a mob of several thousand, this second group from Cobb County, much smaller, didn't really stand a chance. One look at the rifles and fixed bayonets and the mad men of Marietta turned around and scurried back to their big homes with garages in the OTP. The next day, Atlanta papers reported outbursts of violence all across the state. While the citizens of Marietta burned Slayton in effigy, they weren't alone. To the southwest in Noonan, a dummy of Slayton was burned on the town square. Further south in Columbus, a Slayton effigy was raised up and then shot up. Same thing happened to the north in Woodstock. And even way down in South Georgia, the citizens of Valdosta announced plans to build a monument to Mary Fagan, the southern belle disgraced by Slayton's shameful commutation. However, surprisingly, most of the Atlanta newspapers praised Slayton's decision. And within days, newspaper editors from across the country were singing his praises as well. This from the New York Times. Had Georgia sent Frank to the gallows, the good name of the state would have been blackened, and its people would have been ever under reproach. Governor Slayton has saved Georgia from herself. He has made his name illustrious. While cooler heads in the North lauded Slayton for his bravery, assuming the tragic case of Leo Frank now had a tidy resolution, a much different story was unfolding down in Georgia. All that week, the state's citizens seethed with anger. In the pubs and back alleys and fields across the state, the name of John Slayton was despised. His legacy reviled. And the people still wanted their blood. Enter Tom Watson. Do you remember him? In the last episode, I told you about the Georgia politician who'd begun his career as a charming but fiery up-and-comer in the Georgia political scene in the late 1800s. But by the 1900s, Tom Watson had devolved into a vicious political propagandist, using his newspaper, The Jeffersonian, to spread his unique blend of hate for Jews, Catholics, and African Americans. As soon as Watson heard the Frank news, he saw a unique opportunity to fuel the rage already burning around the state. When the next issue of The Jeffersonian hit the streets, it was dripping with rage and rhetoric. For three pages, Tom Watson employs the strongest language, oddly poetic, to decry the Frank commutation. In it, he quotes scripture. He accuses Slayton of being on Frank's payroll. He talks about how Jew money has, quote, debased us, bought us and sold us, and laughs at us still, end quote. He opines at length about the courageous men of the Confederacy, comparing them to the men of Georgia today, saying... And the sons of those Georgians are today bowed down with unspeakable grief, for they feel that our old grand empire state has been raped. He describes the decaying and zombified body of Mary Fagan attempting to escape the grasp of Leo Frank. He slams what he calls the prostitute press, who he thought stumped for Frank. Watson also floated a variety of outlandish conspiracy theories. One of them was that the letter written by Judge Roan in his final days was forged. Yet another was that an escape from the Milledgeville prison had already been arranged, and that within 30 days, Frank would be smuggled to freedom on a northbound train to Yankee land. Throughout the screed, Watson comes back to, dozens of times, this new shame brought upon every Georgian. Here's an example. Where now is the Georgian whose soul does not surge with shame and whose eyes are not dimmed with the tears of infinite humiliation? And then, towards the end. Hereafter, let no man reproach the South with lynch law. Let him remember the unendurable provocation and let him say whether lynch law is better than no law at all. 
Tom Watson believed that Governor Slayton had subjected Georgia's citizens to an unendurable provocation. And using veiled language, he was very carefully seeding a narrative. A narrative targeting the already rage-blind citizens of the state. And that narrative was this. Your governor has disgraced you and has trampled on the rule of law. And the only way to make it right is to rise up, take matters into your own hands, and seize the justice denied to you. Watson's bombastic excoriations of Leo Frank and the miscarriage of justice, they didn't stop there. As June turned to July, Watson cranked out one explosive, hyperbolic hit piece after another. Week after week, the people gathered around Thomas Watson's pig trough of hate and ate it up. The circulation of the Jeffersonian surged, tripling from the year before. Tom Watson, he wasn't writing. He was rallying. And these weren't editorials. Oh, no. This was a call to arms. Hey, Catlick fans, just popping in real fast to remind you about my other podcast. It's called Blue Babies Pink. I'm going to be honest, it's super different from Catholic. It's not true crime. It's not mysterious, really. It's my personal story of growing up gay in the South as the son of a Southern Baptist pastor. Yikes. Like I said, real different. Nevertheless, episodes of BBP have been downloaded or streamed more than 1.3 million times. All 46 episodes are available right now. And don't worry, those episodes are much shorter. They're like 10 minutes each. Again, the name of the show is Blue Babies Pink. Pull it up on your favorite podcasting app or go get all the details over at bluebabiespink.com. All right, back to the show. Tom Watson's invective triggered a fresh wave of violence directed at Governor Slayton. Days later, with the 5th Regiment still guarding Slayton's estate, the troops once again came under siege in the middle of the night. Hiding in the woods of Buckhead, a group of 200 vigilantes opened fire on the militia. The battalion returned fire and began pursuing their unknown attackers through the trees and the brush. When the skirmish died down, no one had been killed or seriously wounded. And the infantry of the 5th Regiment placed 26 men under arrest, including one man who was Mary Fagan's uncle. When Governor Slayton heard of the foiled late-night attack, he was shocked to discover that these weren't hillbillies. These were respected businessmen. The hate ran deeper than even he had anticipated. And what's even more disturbing, that night when the infantry took the bandits into custody they discovered some alarming contraband. Dynamite. This wasn't like the spontaneous mobs from a few nights before. Oh no. This was a carefully calculated assassination attempt. With the governor's term coming to a close, there was the unfinished business of transferring power to the incoming governor, Nathaniel Harris. On Saturday, June 26th at noon, the gallery of the state capitol building filled with spectators as Nathaniel Harris took the oath of office. While the ceremony itself went off smoothly, pandemonium was waiting outside. When John Slayton came bursting out the front doors of the state capitol under a heavily armed escort, he was met by a howling crowd. Lynch him! Many shouted as Slayton dashed towards a waiting automobile. Before he made it, a man emerged from the crowd with an iron pipe. He lunged at the governor, but was intercepted by an armed militiaman. Barely avoiding disaster, Slayton's car sped away, taking him to a reception being held at a nearby hotel. This formal affair, far removed from the chaos at the state house, was attended by local dignitaries and Nathaniel Harris, the new governor. And it was at this luncheon where Slayton delivered some poignant thoughts on his unpopular decision. Honest people may disagree with me, an honest man, but we realize that we must be measured by our consciences. Two thousand years ago, another governor washed his hands of a case and turned a Jew over to a mob. For two thousand years, that governor's name has been accursed. 
If today another Jew were lying in his grave because I had failed to do my duty, I would all through life find his blood on my hands and would consider myself an assassin through cowardice. That night, Slayton and his wife retreated to their Buckhead home and fell asleep to the sounds of gunfire in the nearby woods as soldiers of the 5th Regiment once again held would-be assassins at bay outside the Slayton's home. With their place of residence now a war zone, the Slaytons made a stealthy and pre-planned departure the next morning on a Southern Railways train headed north. When the couple arrived in New York City, they received a hero's welcome. They were swarmed by reporters eager to capture a photo or a quote from the heroic governor who'd saved Leo Frank's life. That night, the Slaytons went out on the town as a guest of New York's wealthy media mogul, William Randolph Hearst. After a week in New York, the couple spent the next three months on vacation, staying as far from Georgia as possible. They toured around the country, traveling to far-flung places like San Francisco, Alaska, and even Hawaii. Aside from Leo Frank, John Slayton was the most hated man in the South. He and his wife had no intention of returning anytime soon. In the days that followed the Frank commutation, something new and evil had been conceived north of Atlanta in Marietta. A group of men had organized themselves into a group called the Knights of Mary Fagan. Their focus was clear, their purpose singular. Avenge the death of Marietta's fallen angel, Mary Fagan. As the secretive group formed, some of the most influential men in that part of the state joined their ranks. Their most notable member was Joseph Mackey Brown. You may remember Brown as a former governor of Georgia. He was the one who ordered the state militia to Forsyth County several years earlier. Throughout the Frank saga, the ex-governor wasn't shy about where he stood. He was an outspoken Frank hater, a hated rival of John Slayton, and unsurprisingly, a close friend of Tom Watson. The group of powerful men met one night just off the Marietta Square, and it was in that meeting that a dark, sinister, and unbelievably impossible plan was hatched. The Knights of Mary Fagan, acting upon Tom Watson's call for revenge, would do what the justice system had failed to do. They would reclaim Georgia's honor. And this, this was their plan. They would recruit a death squad for a very specific mission that would look something like this. Embark from Marietta as a caravan, traveling 120 miles south to Milledgeville over unpaved roads. Break into a heavily fortified state penitentiary, abduct Leo Frank, transport him back 120 miles north while evading authorities in every jurisdiction along the way, and then lynch him in Marietta in broad daylight. Their plan was as evil as it was daring. And it would only be possible with vast resources, a loyal network of people in high places, and a perfectly executed plan. But if anyone could pull that off, it was these wicked men with vast resources and vengeance. Once the wealthy and influential leaders of this group finalized their plan, they set about recruiting specific people to execute it. They first targeted Marietta locals with a background in law enforcement, specifically those with knowledge of the Milledgeville State Prison Compound and its inner workings. Author Steve Oney tells us more. All most equally coveted were men who boasted particular skills that might be needed either during the trip or at the penitentiary. Thus, automobile mechanics, telephone linemen, electricians, doctors, and explosives experts were avidly recruited. Finally, there was the demand for raw muscle, men who could stand and fight. Though most lynch mobs were rough-and-tumble, toothless types, this group was anything but. The sophisticated nature of the mission demanded a more sophisticated breed of lyncher. No roughnecks or tough guys meant this would be no ordinary lynch mob. This would be a white-collar lynch mob. 
After a careful and secretive vetting process, the group selected their 25 men. Now, it's worth pointing out here just how insane this whole situation was. Here you have 25 well-respected men volunteering to go on a highly dangerous covert mission spanning hundreds of miles that would culminate with an unlawful and public execution. Tom Watson's rhetoric, boiling with the power to desensitize, brainwash, and indoctrinate, was about to have legs. Down in Milledgeville, Leo Frank was adjusting to his new life on the prison farm. According to reports, it wasn't the worst place to be, and it was an actual farm where the inmates did all the work. Most of the really hardened criminals got sent to the chain game, so the prison farm was sort of one step above that. Within weeks, Frank had recovered from the traumatic experience of his midnight transport, and he'd settled into a rhythm of doing chores around the facility. He wrote lots of letters while he was there, many to his wife Lucille, and dozens if not hundreds of others to friends around the country. In many of those letters, Leo Frank made clear his future plans. Prove his innocence once and for all, and figure out a way to leave Milledgeville a free man. However, on the night of July 17th, his fairly peaceful life at the prison farm would be violently interrupted. It's now month 55 of our story. On that night, a fellow inmate crept quietly towards Leo Frank's bed. Once into position, the man leapt on top of Frank and plunged a butcher knife deep into his neck. Leo Frank screamed in pain. The lights flickered on and a group of guards rushed in to find the two men grappling and soaked in blood. The attacker, a convicted murderer, was subdued but not before leaving a seven-inch gash in Frank's neck. Now gasping for air and bleeding to death, two other inmates, both of whom were doctors, moved quickly to save Frank's life. They managed to stop the bleeding, stabilizing Leo Frank while waiting on the prison doctor to arrive. Once there, he took Leo Frank immediately into surgery, a frantic attempt to close the wound and save Leo Frank's life. Miraculously, the assailant's knife had missed Frank's carotid artery. Leo Frank's personal doctor drove down from Atlanta in the days following the stabbing. Though he was in pitiful shape, the outlook was promising. Within a few days, Leo Frank was moved out of a hospital bed and into a normal room. Tended to by his wife and several physicians, optimism grew that Frank would make a full recovery. Once again, Leo Frank had dodged death. Though to this day, the motive of Frank's midnight attacker is unknown, and there was no known connection to the Knights of Mary Fagan. On July 22nd, Thomas Watson's Jeffersonian reported on the attempted murder of Frank. Disgustingly, Watson wrote this. The butcher knife used had been an operation during the day killing hogs. Kosher. The hog thing was untrue, and later, Tom Watson would claim that Frank's attacker was only retaliating because Frank had tried to rape him. That also wasn't true. If you haven't figured it out yet, Tom Watson was an evil, evil man. Thanks be to God. I am recovering nicely. Those were the words Leo Frank wrote to a friend on August the 16th. It's now August of 1915, the 56th and final month of our story. By August, Lucille Selig Frank was Leo's primary caretaker. Each morning, she would arrive at the state prison to help care for her ailing husband, who was regaining a bit more strength each day. Leo Frank continued in his writing. I have gained and am gaining right along in strength. My wound is all healed except in one little place. In time, I think I will be all right again. Despite Leo Frank's optimism, all wasn't right. Not at all. That same afternoon, 25 men departed in automobiles from the town of Marietta. They left at different times to avoid suspicion. Each man was armed. One car carried explosives. Another car carried a noose, already tied. One member of their posse was an electrician who also happened to ride a motorcycle. He'd made multiple solo trips to Milledgeville to surveil the telephone lines there. 
After meeting up at a preset rendezvous point, the caravan began their approach into the state prison farm. Around 9 p.m., just as the sun had finally set on a southern summer night, the black automobiles rumbled down a dark and dusty road as the walls of the prison came into view. At that same time, the telephone lines in and around the prison went dark. The electrician had done his job, and the plot was now in motion. Seven cars approached the outer gate of the prison. Before breaching the gate, they had to neutralize the prison's superintendent and warden. The men barged into each man's home with guns drawn. The men and their wives were handcuffed, and a lookout was assigned to keep an eye on them throughout the raid. With the prison's top two officials out of the way, the group's next target was the prison gate. The men pulled into a tight huddle and began their approach. Some were masked, all had guns. Terrified at what he saw and fearing for his life, the night watchman didn't even attempt to stop them. He took out his keys, opened the gate, and essentially welcomed them in. Any anticipated resistance was melting before them. Armed with a map of the property, the death squad then set about acquiring their hostage. The men ascended the stairs of Frank's bunk room and slipped inside. It only took a few seconds for them to find Leo Frank. In the back of the room, in his bed, awake, just where they expected him. Four men were on him in a flash, and within seconds, they were bounding back down the stairs with their hostage in tow. They shoved Leo Frank into the back of a waiting car, but not before one of them dangled the noose in Frank's face while explaining exactly what they planned to do. The car door slammed shut, and all seven automobiles sped off into the night. The entire operation at the prison farm took less than 10 minutes. When those left behind at the prison gathered their wits, they attempted to send an SOS via the phone lines. No luck. Virtually all the phone lines leading out of Milledgeville had been cut. They finally discovered a single functioning line that connected only to Augusta, a small town 100 miles to the east. Several hours after the men had left, news of the raid was finally transmitted to the outside world. And shortly after, in the wee hours of the morning, word of Leo Frank's abduction began to spread through the rural towns of Georgia. Meanwhile, the caravan raced north through the small towns and cotton fields of rural Georgia. They stopped a couple of times to cut even more phone lines along the way. Slowing the spread of news about the raid was a key strategy, knowing that once word was out, local authorities in all these small towns and Atlanta would set up roadblocks, in theory at least. The group took an unorthodox route back to Marietta, opting to swing far east of Atlanta in an effort to avoid the dragnet likely laid by Fulton County Police. This decision was a wise one as the Atlanta press picked up on the story before daybreak. Word was out and Fulton County Police were on patrol. Several reporters even sped to the gravesite of Mary Fagan, responding to rumors that Frank would be lynched there. Around dawn, the kidnappers reached Alpharetta, a town 20 miles east of Marietta. This ploy allowed them to make their final approach into Marietta, not from the south, as police would have expected, but more from the east or even from the north. Now, at some point while coming through Alpharetta, an eighth car joined the caravan. Inside were two of the original masterminds of the plot to abduct Leo Frank. One of those men, Judge Newt Morris. You may remember Judge Newt Morris from a previous episode. He was the man who presided over the sham trials in Forsyth County back in 1912, those of Ernest Knox and Oscar Daniel. And he was the one who'd sentenced the two young black men to hang. Now, here he was, a couple of years later, a high-ranking member of the Georgia judiciary, a man vested with unbelievable power by the state, burning hot with lynching fever, and excitedly racing towards a planned execution. Finally, as the sun came up in Cobb County, the caravan arrived at its destination. Not at Mary Fagan's grave, as was rumored, but at a more rural area just east of Marietta, known as Fray's Gin. A former sheriff owned the land, and he was the one who also tied Leo Frank's noose. This place was also symbolic in that it sat across from the childhood home of Mary Fagan. 
The men arrived at their destination, and the car doors flung open. Leo Frank stumbled out into the light, surrounded by his captors within a small stand of trees. A single, large oak tree stood before him. Knowing this was the end, Frank asked if he could write a final letter to his wife. Surprisingly, his request was granted. After penning a quick letter, he spoke his final words. I think more of my wife and my mother than I do of my own life. It's not totally known what he meant by that, but author Steve Oney points out that we only know what was said by way of one of the lynchers many years later, so it's tough to verify. In his book, Steve Oney describes the final scene. With soft morning sunlight dappling down through the late summer foliage, the vigilantes blindfolded Frank, bound his feet together, cinched a khaki cloth around his exposed lower torso, lifted him onto the table, and placed the noose over his head. After agreeing to return Frank's wedding band to Lucille, a man identified in most reports as simply the leader pronounced the court's sentence and kicked over the table. The time was 7.05. The man was Judge Newt Morris. Frank's death was one of slow suffocation. Georgia's unbearable provocation had been avenged. It didn't take long for locals to hear the news. Within minutes, carloads and wagons full of excited Cobb Countyans descended upon the murder scene. Something of a celebration broke out, and the crowd of men, children, and women toting infants grew to over a thousand. Several photographers were on hand to capture the excitement. Many of the onlookers expressed benign relief, making statements that the justice of God had prevailed. Once again, from Steve Oney. That Frank's inanimate form inspired near hysteria was hardly surprising. For all the tribal rituals by which the White South asserted itself, none released more primitive energies than a lynching. And of all the men who ever wound up at the end of a lynch mob's rope, few conjured as many explosive associations as this one. Murderer. Sodomite. Jew. Yankee. These were fighting words to everyone gathered at Fray's Gin. The group of a thousand quickly swelled to over 3,000. As the crowd grew, so did the hysteria. Within minutes, a local, well known roughneck fired a gun in the air and began clamoring to burn Frank's body. It was actually Judge Newt Morris who spoke up and dissuaded the crowd from taking such action. Justice has been served, Morris reminded them. There was no need to desecrate Frank's body. Moments later, someone cut the lynching rope and Frank's body tumbled to the ground in a heap. As Newt Morris attempted to make room for the undertaker, the well-known roughneck who'd spoken up earlier slammed his heel into Frank's head, grinding it into the dirt. Fighting through the crowd, the undertaker's two black assistants managed to extract the body and place it in a basket in the back of the funeral wagon. When the wagon began speeding towards the cemetery, most of the gathered crowd followed in pursuit. Some on foot, some in cars, some in buggies. Judge Newt Morris, a friend and a reporter, jumped in their black Model T and made a beeline for the wagon, knowing that this situation was a disaster waiting to happen. When they reached it, Morris jumped out of the car, mounted the horse-drawn wagon, pulled it off to the side of the road, and then managed to somehow load Leo Frank's body into the back seat of his automobile. Drive like hell to Atlanta, he shouted to his partner, now behind the wheel. As the car raced south, they were surrounded by other vehicles, packed with men, hanging out the windows, shouting and jeering along the way. When they got to Smyrna, they arranged a transfer, moving Frank's body to the hearse of a funeral home based in Atlanta. The hearse finished the transport, and when the body was moved inside the funeral home, a new crowd began to gather, demanding to see the body. Fearing a riot, a local Atlanta police captain relented. He ordered that the body be moved to the funeral home's chapel where people could view it in an orderly fashion under the watchful eye of several dozen policemen on horseback. For hours, local Atlantans slowly passed by Leo Frank's mangled body. Some were mortified, but 
Most were stoic, quietly pleased that justice, at least in their minds, had finally been served. In all, more than 15,000 people viewed Frank's body on that hot and humid afternoon of August 17th. Up in Marietta, photographers quickly printed their photos and began selling them to eager buyers. Many of them were turned into postcards and sent to friends and family across the country. Hours later, Fiddlin' John Carson appeared on the Marietta Town Square, where people were still celebrating. Everyone wanted to hear his now famous song that paid tribute to Marietta's 13 year old victim. Little Mary Fagan, she went to town one day. She went to the pencil factory to get her little pay. She left her home. At- and on this terrible note, we conclude our 56 month epic. But the story, it's not over. We have one more episode of Cat Lick, and I hope you'll join me as I bring closure to each of our four stories and attempt to make sense of the hell and chaos that seemed to rain down on Georgia between 1911 and 1915. Were there any more Ripper-like murders? What became of Forsyth County and all that land that was stolen from the banished Black families? And what is Forsyth County like today? Have things gotten better? Have they acknowledged the sins of their past? What was the legacy of the Fulton Cotton Mill strike of 1914? Did anything change in Cabbage Town? And what became of Oscar Elsis, Harry Preston, and Ola Delight Smith in the years after the strike? Furthermore, what about Leo Frank? Was he really guilty, or did the proud men of Georgia lynch an innocent man? And what changed with the deathbed confession of one of the quietest and most obscure witnesses of the Frank trial? We'll also look at how the aftershocks of these stories rippled through America for the next 100 years and even today. And finally, I'll answer the question I posed way back in episode one. Is America the hero or the villain? We're going to wrap everything up in our Catlick finale. Please don't miss it. That's next time on Catlick. Catlick is recorded in Atlanta's historic Cabbage Town neighborhood. Executive producer, Walnut Ridge Harmon. Original music and sound design by Duciel. Cover art by Rachel Eleanor. Catholic store manager, Brett Harmon. Special thanks to the staff of the Georgia Institute of Technology, Library, Archives, and Special Collections. Also, special thanks to author Steve Oney, whose book, And the Dead Shall Rise, was an invaluable resource in the making of this episode. To get the deep, and I mean the really deep dive on the Leo Frank case, I highly encourage you to pick up a copy of his book today. But I'll warn you, it's a doozy. Catholic Instagram follower of the week, Lisa Johnson. Catholic Instagram story star of the week, Tiffany Schwartz, who says, if you love history, intrigue, podcasts, mysteries, kitten producers, beautifully curated social media, and a Southern narrator, then please listen to Catlick Podcast. Thank you so much, Tiffany. Catlick Twitter follower of the week, Heather Smith. Also, in our final episode, I'm going to be announcing some special host Catlick additions to the vault. You're not going to want to miss out on those. So do yourself a favor now by subscribing to the vault today. Just go to catlick.com, click on vault. And finally, Catlick is independently written and produced by me, BT Harmon, signing off. I'd like to remind you to save old buildings, build bike lanes, and vote for public transit. We'll see you in the next and final episode.